Well, good morning, everyone out there on Facebook. I'm Father Brett. I'm here with my next session of To Know and to Love, where we will grow in our knowledge of our Lord and of our faith so that we can learn to love Him in a deeper and more satisfying way. I'm here in this first week of May, so we enter into the month where we honor mothers, but where we especially honor our mother, Mary, who is, you see here, I have this lovely picture of Mary here in this office carrying the child Jesus. And one of the kind of key dogmas, key beliefs that we have about Mary that we get directly from the scriptures is that she is the mother of Jesus. She's the one who was handpicked by God to be the one who bore Jesus Christ, who was a savior, who was God incarnate. What you may or may not know is that there was some controversy about what this meant for in the church for quite a few years. And so today, in beginning our sessions, going and talking about Mary during this month of May, working through what are called the four Marian dogmas. Today, we're going to look at the first, what I believe in history was the first dogma to actually be pronounced as a belief that we Catholics believe, and is that Mary is called the mother of God, and she is the mother of God. And we're going to explore what that means, because it tells us something very important about what we say about who Jesus is. If I kind of, this is going to be going into some very technical language maybe. I'm going to try to bring it down as much as I can. If you get lost or if I say something that doesn't make sense to you, feel free to send me questions. I know this is not live like I usually do this. However, be sure to send me questions. Send us questions at St. Genevieve for me and I'll be able to get back to those questions at a later date. So what does it mean when we talk about Mary as the mother of Jesus Christ. We obviously see in scriptures that she is the mother of Jesus. That's clear to us. We can see that in Luke's gospel, how the angel comes to her and she bears Jesus Christ. I mean, it's pretty plain as day. But does the scriptures also tell us that she is the mother of God? Well, it seems clear from Luke's gospel that he, she, she is. The angel comes to her and he says, Do not be afraid, Mary. You will bear a son, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. He refers to the child she is to bore as the Son of God. And we see in the scriptures that it's used as a title, not just as a word. There's, sometimes you see the word sons of God used in the scriptures to talk about angels, but here it's really talking about God's Son which means that it is someone who is of the same nature as God. It is God himself. That's what we talk about in the Trinity. The Son is the Son of the Father, but the Son is still fully God. And yet they're, you know, this Trinitarian theology where they are also still distinct people. God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Trinity, yet all are God. So it seems, at least on the surface, that Mary must be the mother of God, because if Jesus is truly God, then she is his mother, and therefore the mother of God. But it wasn't that simple. See, there was a big controversy in the early church called the Nestorian Controversy, which was started, obviously, by the name, by a guy named Nestorius. And in that controversy, he said, Nestorius said, looking at this, that it can't be that Mary is the mother of God. Because according to his logic, and according to what can seem to be very sound logic, is that Mary cannot birth God. In, in a sense, Mary cannot birth divinity, like the divine nature. Like, when we talk about divinity, it's like, what makes God, God? And so, he said, like, God, divinity, doesn't come from anything. It is what creates everything. And so how could a human person birth, bring to birth, God? And so there's that one piece of it where he says it can't be that she's the mother of God. But also he was facing a 
dilemma of how can we reconcile the fact that Jesus Christ is truly God, but yet truly man. And he said that you can't have it be to where there's just one person with these two things together, because then you either have one dominating the other, or you have like this weird blending, because in his mind, in the mind of the church, one person means you can only have one nature, one thing that makes the person who they are. Like, I am a human person, therefore I have a human nature. You all out watching this are all human persons, therefore you have a human nature. A desk, a book, all have the nature of a desk, a book, that makes them an individual desk or an individual book. So if only one person can have one nature, not saying that a desk and a book are a person, that's kind of getting a little, but you get the idea. Like us as people, us as individual persons have one nature that makes us persons. The human nature make is what in kind of informs and helps us to become a person. And so this person, this guy, Jesus, can't have these two natures and still be one person because only one nature equals one person. That's how they, they thought it. That's how most natural things exist. And so he proposed that Christ was actually two persons, a divine person with the divine nature, the Word, the Son of God, and a human person with the human nature of Jesus. Now, this may be confusing. How can that work? But you see, what he's trying to do is try not to confuse Jesus Christ's divine and human nature. He's not trying not to mix them together. He's trying not to like, have something from the human affect the divine because in the divine nature, in a way, is supposed to be what's called immutable or unchangeable. Like, nothing is supposed to be able to change it. It's perfect. It's eternal. And so how can the human nature and the divine nature be combined in one person without the divine nature losing something of itself, without it changing? And that's what he's trying to grapple with. Now, that seems odd, but that's what he's done. But what happens is that, obviously, you know, if Jesus Christ is two people and not one, then there's this... Uh, too hard of a distinction between his divine and human nature, and therefore, like Jesus, we can say that God did not become man, and that has all kinds of implications for like whether or not we were saved. I mean, think about that. If God did not become man, then were we saved? I mean, yes, Jesus Christ, the man, may have died on the cross, but was that good enough to atone for the entirety of humanity's sins, in order to wipe to wipe away original sin, in order to bring us back to God. Was that enough? And so that is something that this theory, the problem that this theory kind of came up to. And we're going to see that this is not what the church adopted. And there was a council that happened, and there was different pieces, different people at that council, council the council of Ephesus, where you had Nestorius there trying to purport his opinion, and then you had a saint, Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, I believe, either Jerusalem or Alexandria, is one of the Cyrils, um, who proposed an opposite opinion that, with some like nuance, eventually became what the church believes. And what does the church believe? Obviously, they don't think that there are these two people because that would call into question whether or not Christ really came to save us. But what they believe is that the Son the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Word, truly united Himself, truly took to Himself a human nature in its real, physical, personal way. A real, physical, and personal union that God, the Son, united a human nature to Himself. He took on our humanity in its fullness without a blend without making some amalgamation of God and man. It's truly God, 100% God, and 100% man. Truly God, truly man is when we talk about Christ. And so, it's something that is not seen before. That's something, the incarnation is not something that has been seen before. And what is it that has not been seen before? It's that one person 
has these two natures that inform him, that make him that person. The divinity, the Word, the Son of God, and a human nature in its totality. And because of the mystery of God becoming man, those two natures are united in one divine person, that is Jesus Christ. That is the mystery that we celebrate. And that is why the Council of Ephesus eventually proclaimed that Mary is truly the mother of God, or in Greek, Theotokos, which literally means the God-bearer. It literally means God-bearer. She bore to birth the God-man. She bore to birth Jesus Christ, who is true God and true man. And while she doesn't, like, she doesn't create in herself or bring to birth, like, divinity itself, divine nature, because Jesus Christ, and think about this for a second, Jesus Christ is one divine person, one person, that she is truly the mother of God because she bore Jesus Christ. And it's that simple. And it it's, may even seem that simple to you, and you may wonder why it's such a controversy, but obviously go back to all that and, and see kind of all these things and all these nuances that have to be made. But the point is, is that because of how much God loved us and desired to be united to us, like he came and became one of us so intimately that he did something that is not seen anywhere in nature this one person with two natures where neither one of those natures are you know made any less than 100% any less than themselves they're completely united together without one overtaking the other and that's the beauty in the, of the mystery of the incarnation is that mary brought to birth the person who is truly god the son the word made flesh who has taken on our humanity and has taken on our sins and eventually will die on the cross and rise from the dead for our salvation. That is the mystery we celebrate. And that is why we call Mary the mother of God. That's why we hold her up as the mother of God and why we celebrate her as the mother of God and eventually the mother of us Christians who have been called to be that image of Christ because of what her role was in bringing to this earth, bringing to birth in her own womb, bringing to the world Jesus Christ, who is both God and man, the Word made flesh. And I'll just end with this little passage from the Catechism that kind of sums this up in a really neat way. This is the Catechism 495, called in the Gospels the mother of Jesus, Mary is acclaimed by Elizabeth at the prompting of the Holy Spirit and even before the birth of her son, the mother of the Lord. In fact, the one whom she conceived as man by the Holy Spirit, who truly became her son according to the flesh, was none other than the Father's eternal Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Hence, the Church confesses that Mary is truly Mother of God, Theotokos. And the reason this is really awesome, and like I said in my previous video, is that everything that we say about Mary has such profound implications about what we say about Jesus. And that is why we honor her so highly is because everything that she does, even what we say about her, is her trying to get to point us to Jesus Christ and to worship him as who he truly is. And so as today we dive into this idea, this dogma, this belief of Mary as the mother of God, I pray and I hope that through her intercession, you would also grow in your devotion and worship of our Lord as God among us, as that Emmanuel who has come in order to save us, who has come to give us eternal life. That is what she provides to us. That's what she offers to us. So, as we end the session, I apologize again that I'm not able to do this live. I mean, it's a lot of things going on this Tuesday, so unfortunately I can't be with you live, but please send me your questions, either through the St. Genevieve Facebook page, or you can send it on my 
public figure page at Father Brett Laparus on Facebook. Or you can... No, those are the only two options. <laughs> Sorry. So, please send us your questions. If this may be in a little too technical for you, that's fine. I can, send me a question. Just say, I have no idea what you said. And I will explain it again if you need to. Um, and probably try to dig a little deeper. But overall, I just hope that this has helped you to come to a greater appreciation of Mary's role within the church and of what she teaches us about her son. And I hope and pray that as you grow in this knowledge, that you grow to love her in a much deeper way during this blessed month of May. And from all of us here at St. Genevieve, I pray that you will have a blessed day, a blessed week, and a happy life. God bless you.